anyways, there was a loud crash and I, I heard a crash and we couldn't land at the airport that we needed to. And like my parents were coming to pick me up. Like it was, it was scary. There was nothing I could do. Loud crash. Like people are crying. And it was, it was during like the, the Bitcoin spike and everyone was like a crypto holder on the plane. And I was just picturing like the headlines that give like seven crypto traders and one penny stock trader dead. Like this is the top. And I was just like, I'm going to fucking go down in a jet with these crypto fucks. Yeah. And I was so pissed. That's the worst way, that's the worst way to go with all the crypto guys in the plane with you. <laughs> What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Today we have probably one of the most famous guests we had on at all, and everyone knows who he is. We have Tim Sykes. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for coming on today, my man. No, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan. No, we're excited, man. So I wanted to start with the first question, Tim. Where the hell are you located right now? Where are you? So on social media, I'm in Zanzibar, but that was like two trips ago, uh, three trips ago, because after that, I went to Bali, Paris. Now I'm in Italy for the next Got few it. weeks. I'm all over so the place. I, I know why you post a little bit delayed, but can you kind of give the audience uh, the story of why you started posting delayed? Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun to be well known. Like I appreciate, you know, people coming up to me and it's cool, but you know, it's also a gift and a curse. Sometimes I want a little privacy. Also like my friends and family, you know, deserve a little privacy. So I've had to like pull back. You know, I started very much in people's faces and just live all the time and I've I've kind of drawn back just a little bit. You know, I think people should be a little more careful just about what they post on social media. We don't really realize the consequences. Nothing bad has happened, but you know, you just you just have to choose what kind of life you want, you know? So didn't didn't someone try to kidnap you once? Not not kidnap me, but they, they met me at the airport when I wasn't expecting them. And what? I, I have a few stories like that. But again, it's it's nothing <laughs> terrible has happened, nothing even that bad, but it's just like wow, like we throw ourselves out there. There's a lot of people out there. Um you know, you, you just got to be a little careful. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little delayed. It's taken the fun out of uh, social media a little bit, but they're worse. Things. I remember sitting at the, uh, the conference one year, I went to one of the trader investor summits back in uh, 16 or 17. It was like one of those, but all of a sudden we're sitting there and uh, Tim Sykes starts tweeting and we're staring right at Tim Sykes. And we're like, this man is a fucking magician. How is this happening? And he was like tweeting from Africa, and we're like, "Oh, I I'm, maybe I'm living in the Matrix right now, but this is fucking weird." <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you 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 gotta you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, you know, so I I used to be like everyone like post where you are all the time, like be fully transparent. Now I'm just like be transparent with your trading, like show your losses. That's I think that matters more than like your specific location. It doesn't matter whether I'm in Bali or New York or, or Italy or Paris. Like I'm always keeping New York hours. Like when I'm in Asia, I'm extra crazy because like I'm up all night trading and then we have like charity or like I, I go on a lot of food trips in Japan. So it's either food or charity during the day and then trading at night. So I'm just a psycho more than normal. Yeah, you are always working and traveling with people and just like, going like absolutely crazy. Do you ever get tired of making content? Because you have been going, making a lot of content, man. Like, and it must get tiring over the years. Is there ever a time where you're like, oh my God, like I'm so tired? Yeah, I mean, the cool thing also about posting later is like I have like seven or eight trips that I haven't even posted. Like some, you know, sometimes we work with hotels and they're pissed, they're like, where, when are you posting? I'm like, don't worry, I'm doing it. And I also was like fat last year, now I'm thinner. So like, I'm gonna post one of these trips. <laughs> People are gonna be like, you were, you're fat again. And I'm like, yeah, you know, but it's really from like last year. Um, you know, so I, I, I have content stored up. Um, but yeah, sometimes it gets tiring. But again, like the world is so fascinating. I, I can never get over it. I've been to now 134 countries. I'm running out of countries. Um, but we're, we live in the most fascinating time in the history of the world and, and more people need to see it. And I, I wish that it was the matrix, you know, maybe like Elon and Neuralink will work or something in the future where like I can transfer all of this into your heads and you'll be like, oh my God, Sri Lanka is amazing. Like there's so many crazy places out there. So it does get tiring sometimes, but at the same time, like I'm just motivated. It's crazy. I feel like Tim, you've been doing this for so long. Like I feel like you were really like a, a pioneer and like not only like on social media, but like 
advertising yourself and like being a part of it. How did you even come up with that idea to like really put yourself out there like so much of your life? Yeah, I mean, I was just a drunk. I drank a lot and, and people laughed when I was drunk and I said funnier stuff. And uh, I was on Wall Street Warriors. I was drunk in every episode. I was very introverted I back that. then. So I needed, I needed liquid courage. And like, it helped because I, I made it more entertaining. Like trading can be boring. Finance, money people can be boring. So I was like, screw this. Let's, let's have fun with it. Now I don't need to drink and I can't drink for shit. And now I'm just like, I'm out there too much. I have like verbal diarrhea. Like I can't, I can't pull it back in even if I wanted to. Um, so it's, it, it's just getting it out there. And again, like we, we're all fortunate. Are you struggling to find the right stocks to trade? Are you making money for one, two, maybe three weeks in a row and losing it all in one day? Are you struggling with sizing up on your trades? Well, I found that the best way to fix these problems is to trade alongside a millionaire trader live on stream with no delays. My Investing Club's new live trading stream is the missing puzzle piece to your trading. Every day at 9 a.m., I share my screens, find the best stocks to trade, and build my watches live. Then I execute those trades live on screen. It's like you're sitting right next to me as I trade every every single day. Due to the high demand of the screen share, we only have a few spaces available every single month. So if you're seeing this now, it means that space is still available. And here's the best part. If I do not generate $20,000 in realized gains per month on live stream, you do not pay. So go to myinvestingclub.com slash live trading to get 50% off your first month on the live stream. Spaces are limited and filling up quick. What do you have to lose? This may change your life. To, to be alive right now with all this technology and you know we're all trading that this is the best market we're in the the most successful country in the history of the world like people just need perspective so it, it feels like I'm doing it for a while because a lot of you guys are young and maybe I've been doing it you know I've been trading for a quarter of a century that's older than a lot of my students um but I've that's been older than Harry 15, right Harry here I mean he's like that's older than me <laughs> it's impressive it's very and impressive. you can grow more facial hair than i can still so like it, i just i get like packets like it's it's like weird you're like yo calm down want to be rabbi like it's not good I'm in the same boat <laughs> whatever works i mean it's it we're, we're still just beginning like it, the internet is only like what 30 years old like we don't even realize how big this is this is like being alive when like when the printing press got invented or you know this is this is revolutionary and people still don't truly capitalize on it we have a lot of misinformation i think people who are using this technology the wrong way like the kardashians where like now girls do you know what the average guess this here's this how many average photos does a girl take before they post one photo on social media? Thanks to the Kardashians and a lot of other people like that. Yes. On average. It has to be 50. I, I would guess 100. I'm going to go low and say seven. The, the study that I read said 38. But taking yeah, 38, that's... understand, they're not going to like 38 different places. It's like a selfie here, 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 here. No, I don't like that. No, I don't like that. And you're in this, this zone where it's so stupid and it's so vapid and it's sad. And like, I was even, I posted on uh, some, somebody po posted like Kim Kardashian's sink. And it's like this cool sink where like you, it, it looks flat, but there's like indentations and she had it redesigned seven times. And I'm just like, how much money can you waste? Like, I get it. I like luxurious things too, but how many schools can you build? How many other people could you help with your platform? But she just doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. Something that you mentioned, Tim, is that perspective shift. And I know that uh, you travel the world. So is there a specific place that you went to that you kind of had that perspective shift in your own life? So many different perspective shifts. I'll, I'll say Bali really opened my eyes. I was, you know, at the time, this was before I started my charity. I was going, you know, I've been traveling for a while. This is the beauty of trading. But, you know, there's only so many luxury pools that you can be in. You can be like, look at this luxury pool. Oh, I have a pina colada. That's so beautiful. And it's like, <laughs> it's fun, but it gets boring after a while. So I actually said this to my driver in Bali at the Viceroy Ubud, beautiful resort. And I was like, take me to your village. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, why do you want to see that? Like, we don't have a lot of money. I was like, no, I want to see like the real Bali. And we saw his village met his family. It was really cool. Um, you know, and, and it started me down this path of like wanting to help, you know, other communities, not necessarily just luxury, uh, visit luxury hotels and, and resorts and, and really meeting with the people, especially, you know, we are all from the most valuable 
most historically successful country in the world. The dollar goes very far. I know it has a lot of haters, but the dollar can go so far. And now, you know, my charity has donated a little over $8 million. We have 115 schools, uh, libraries. Now we're doing computer labs. Uh, we have a soccer field in Cambodia. Uh, we're doing two recycling centers now. And the money can just go so far when you see that impact. So I encourage everyone listening to not just go to the normal places. I know that especially in the trading world, you can get stuck in this like Miami, New York, LA, you know, Vegas every now and then, maybe a little Burning Man, maybe a little like Formula One, maybe a little Art Basel. And it's like, come on, like you, you have the same conversations. There's only so many bottles. I like Story too. I like Live, you know, I like Eleven. All these places, they're fun, but like, there's so much more you can do with your life and with your money. That's incredible, dude. That was awesome. <laughs> I just, I, I think it's very rare to meet someone who actually like puts their money where their mouth is, especially when it comes to like charitable and like, uh, like events and like giving money away. What was like when you started, did you have the concept in your head that you were going to open like a hundred schools or were you like, I just want to do this and like make, and it feels good. But how did you go to like grow this big? So it's like trading. Like you don't, you don't say like, Oh, I'm going to trade a million shares today. You start small paper trade, take small positions, try to find your process, try to find your groove. And that's what I did with the schools. I mean, I, I wanted to build a lot, but I didn't really know how there's some bad charities you have to watch out for. Um, you know, we had our first 3d printed school in Madagascar, which has been like a total mess, but we're trying a new technology. Um, you, you start small and then you see how it goes. And, you know, I didn't intend on doing computer labs or recycling centers, but we found out that's what the community needed. That's why it's good not just to donate the money, but to go to the community. You see what they need. Like now we're doing clean water uh, programs because we met with people and, and families. We're building homes now. We have we built 13 homes in Bali. I went there just on my last trip. I haven't even posted the video yet, but we're talking with the families. There's been a drought in Bali. So they're like spending what they have so little money and they're spending it on clean water. Normally they capture water from the rain and they have like slanted roofs and they capture it. We give them like water filters, but there hasn't been water. So they have to go to the grocery store, buy water. And it's like, this is terrible. So now we're, we're working on new water plants, um, you know, to get them more clean water. And just by talking to them, um, and, and seeing them in person, you really find this out. I met this other family. We built them a home. Um, you know, we have one of their children in a school. And then I was talking with the family and, you know, we're also filming a documentary. So you guys will be able to see all of this soon. We've been filming a documentary for two years. We want to showcase all of it. But just going there in person, meeting the family, there was another uh, one of their children who's too, like, afraid of going to school because he doesn't know how to read. He's, like, a little behind. He's afraid that, like, the other students are going to make fun of him. And I was like, we'll get you a tutor. We'll get you caught up. And he was like, the dad was crying. He's crying. And I'm like, this is so simple, but they're so like, they don't want to ask for help. They're very proud, but you know, a tutor, I mean, literally I, I looked at the pricing and it's like $300 for like a year's worth of tutoring and that will catch him up. And then he can go to normal school. And he was just too afraid to ask because he's embarrassed. You never have to be embarrassed. Anybody watching this, if you don't know how to read, if you're not good at math, if you're not good at trading, if you're not good at anything, we all start somewhere. You, you should never be too proud to ask for help. That's the beauty of this. Look at this. Where are you guys right now? We're, we're talking all over the world. Where are you all? Colorado. I'm in Jersey. I'm actually in New Brunswick, Canada right now. I'm in Boston. And think about this. This, this was not possible just a few years ago. And now we have it all. Like I, I read some report, what, we have like three quarters of a million dollars worth of technology like in our iPhone. And it costs, you know, still costs a lot, but... It's, it's crazy how technology prices are coming down. You can get your whole DNA sequence now for like 200 bucks a few years ago. It would have been like millions. Like this yeah. is insane what we can do right now. People just need to be pushed a little and like, you know, made aware. No, that's totally, totally true. And something that's really uh, interesting to me, Tim, is that you've been trading for a really, really long time and you've seen all different types of market cycles. You've seen all different types of market shifts. So what for maybe a new trader looking to get started today, what advice would you give him on this current market cycle that we're in? Yeah, I mean, the most money that you make will be over several years. Like I have 34 millionaire students now, which is crazy. You can look at the data from all their trades. It's cool that they post all their trades. None of them made much or anything in year one. Doesn't matter what kind of market it is. And let's remember a lot of people who made a lot of money who started in 2020 or 2021 during the mania, 
they lost it. They lost most or all of it because they didn't have the proper lessons. So I would encourage people to really start small. Think about building your, your trading education and your trading journey is like a house, like building a foundation first. And you need knowledge as the foundation. Trade small, paper trade. Don't expect a lot of money or anything. Like, I don't know if you guys have had Jack Kellogg on yet. He lost 2,600 year one. He was trading almost every day. And he paid me several thousand for my challenge. So he's down like 10,000 after year one. And this guy has become arguably one of the best traders up over $12 million now. So if the best trader doesn't even make money, like Tim Grittani made nothing his first year, he blew up his first account. Like it's, you can't expect too much too soon, but you can really build on your, your knowledge and your compounding of your account year two, year three, year four, year five. Use the current volatility. Like this is supposed to be a slow month. I, I wasn't even supposed to be trading that much. August was just an amazing month for trading. So take what you can to learn what you can. Bull market, bear market. I see people worried about like comparisons to 1929 and 1987 coming up in October. But, you know, perhaps the Fed will start cutting interest rates. I've seen other comparisons to bull market years. You can't guess the market. You don't know when the next crash is going to be. You don't know when the next mania is going to be. All you can do is control your preparation. And I tell people, I sign off my webinars. I'm like, who's ready to crush it in 2027? And they're like, what time zone are you in? Why? It's 2023. And I'm like, no, you got to think about what you can learn now, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, to be ready for the mania potentially of 2027 or 2030. But people don't want that. They want hot picks. They want money right away you know, 90% of traders lose. So they're trying to prove to themselves, their family, their friends, social media, that they can make money right away. You don't have to prove that. You have to prove that you know how to grow your account so that when you have enough knowledge, when you have the right market, that's when you really capitalize. Like if there's a mania like 2020, 2021. So Tim, you're uh, truly, I don't, I don't know how many people have actually acknowledged this publicly, but you're the reason why most of us are sitting here in this room right now. Your ability to market, your ability to attract people into day trading, into the stock market is the reason why I'm sitting here right now, is the reason why I can't speak for others, but that's the reason why I'm sitting here. Had I never seen a Tim Sykes ad, I would, end up, I would never be sitting here right now. So how did you get into it? And then how, what was it that clicked that all of a sudden you went, whoa, this could be so much more than what I just did. I mean, I'm Jewish Forrest Gump. Like things just happen to me. And I'm, 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 I'm not a smart man, but I know what trading is. Um, it's, it's crazy. Like I, 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 you know, there's a case that can be made that this is all like a simulation because things just work out for me, even with my losses. And like my losses help me learn what not to do. Um, you know, getting in a fight with Randall Lane, uh, who was this this big time magazine editor of Trader Monthly. And then he like just ripped my name through all of his press friends. Like when I first got started teaching the, the Reuters article after I talked to her for four hours and thought that she understood my story. And the article title is failed hedge fund manager tries again on the internet. And I'm like, ah! um, <laughs> the ups and the downs, like it's, it's crazy, but I appreciate the downs um, and you learn from them. But I, I got started trading senior year of high school. I had surgery on my arm. I had Tommy John surgery. I was a tennis player, couldn't play tennis anymore. I had surgery. They take something out of your other arm. They put it in this arm. I'm walking around with two casts. I look like freaking RoboCop. And yeah, I can't do much, but this was 1999. The stock market was going crazy. You could have been a moron and put your money in anything and made a lot. And I made roughly a hundred grand senior year of high school, which was a lot. I'm from a small town in Connecticut. Um, freshman year in college, the first four months is when the NASDAQ went from 2000 to 5,000. I grew the hundred thousand into nearly a million freshman year. And I, you know, I have three fake IDs taken away from me. I can't even drink beer. Like I, I'm a downloading illegal movies from Merck in my freshman dorm room. Like I didn't deserve to make nearly a million dollars. Like what's going on? And you'll laugh. My number one strategy at the time, companies just added .com to their name. And they would spike for three, four, five days in a row. Sportsman's Guide opened my eyes. They sell camping gear. I think they're still around. I put out a press release. Sportsman's Guide is now sportsmansguide.com. We're going to sell camping gear online. Three to 12 in a week. Not even all at once. And I'm like, 
are you in the over and over again, like there was probably 500 different companies that added .com, every single one of them, double, triple, quadrupled. Um, Market Watch was, was an IPO before CBS bought them. That was like up 50,000%. Like it's, it was stupid, but I was in the right place at the right time. A lot of people made a lot of money in 99 and 2000, but I learned short selling in 2001, 2002, because I realized that there were so many pump and dumps. And then I gravitated towards that. Not many people adapted. No, most people don't, never adapt. They find one hot strategy and then they think that's it. Hodlers, for example. <laughs> so when the, okay. when that stuff was going wild, how are you submitting orders? Are you, are you using a gateway PC? Um, I mean, this was old school. I was using CompuServe and AOL dial-up modems. Um, I, I remember there was a, the Y2K thing was going on. And I remember I went in, I had made like my first, I, I think it was like, maybe I made like 50,000. So I took my parents into New York to see a Broadway show. They had never seen a Broadway show. We didn't grow up with a lot of money. So it was a big thing. And there was a Y2K stock. I want to say it was like GR8, like great um something's corny like that and everyone was afraid y2k like all the computers were shut down these y2k stocks were surging and I, I think i sold some before the broadway show just in case but i came back and it had gone from like 50 to like 118 in a day and i was like pissed that i had sold some and i was like what no accelerate acceler eight with the eight at the end <laughs> um uh... it wasn't good Sorry. And this, I mean, this was 20 plus years ago. Forgive me. But like, well, you're, you're doing pretty good for two decades. That comes, well, it, 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 it comes back. Now, if you look at like a lot of companies say we're getting into crypto or we're, we're working with chat GPT, we're getting into AI. It's the same thing. A lot of companies were getting into the marijuana business. You see these kind of hype cycles. If you compare Ebola stocks versus COVID stocks, it's very similar. COVID just actually went, you know, more than Ebola. Ebola never really took off. I blame myself for not taking advantage of monkeypox. I was like, monkeypox is such a joke. Those stocks spiked again. And I should have realized that the joke could have been profitable. Did you guys bank on the monkeypox stocks? No, I missed that one. Which, which sector do you think is making the most headway right now? You know, do you think AI has the ability to be that sector that stays around? You know, you have crypto you have marijuana you had ebola you had the police scanners where it was hmny and dk or whatever it was dgly, DGLY. yeah DGLY. and all of those and then the shippings and everything else but do you think ai is that sector that much like dot com it's here to stay not all industries trade well um marijuana stocks for example big boom but when they were crashing they didn't bounce i you know i i remember mmnff the craziest ticker and it just dropped and it kept dropping this was you know jack kellogg and kyle williams biggest loss th those days because they dip bought and it, it just kept dropping they sized in they each lost six figures i take very small trades I made like two grand and I was like, trade like a sniper, trade like a coward. And they're like, shut up. And they were making millions like on the month anyways. Um, you can trade as conservative or as aggressive as you want, but like AI trades very similar to marijuana. Like even Nvidia, when they were breaking out, the other AI stocks were gapping up five, 10%. By the end of the first day of Nvidia's big earnings spike, the other AI stocks were red on the day. It was very strange. So. Um, and now, you know, NVIDIA keeps going. And, and I know some people say like it's accounting tricks. Some people say it's just the beginning of the AI revolution. Like there's AAOI, which keeps going. I was buying that in the sixes and selling it in the sevens. And I was like, yeah, now it's like, you know, double. Um, you know, it crushed it. it. Ah, fuck. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was happy just to, to win. Like, to I'm happy that there's like a hot sector. 2022, there wasn't really much. It was just like survival of the fittest. It was like the Hunger Games. Um, now it's just like, now AI is at least pushing stuff forward, but it's not, it's not as easy as crypto. Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's some nuances. So I, I wouldn't be too aggressive right now. September and October are going to be very volatile. It would be cool if we come back to the year high, like I wouldn't want to be a short seller. Like I know a lot of short sellers, like their hearts are failing. They're going for weekly medical checkups. I have some short selling students. You know, they have like gray hair, like literally students who are literally the same age as me and they look like fucking Gandalf. And it's not like a prequel Gandalf. It's like, <laughs> you shall not pass. And I'm like, they're the same age as me, dude. So 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a short right now, but at the same time, like, I don't know if we're going to break out to new highs again. I just take it one trade, one fad at a time. Um, I'm just happy to be green. You know, I was green in 2022. I'm, I'm green in 2023. I donate all my trading profits to charity these days. I trade like a little bitch. And I think that is good to trade like a little bitch, especially if you're new. Like this is not the time to be aggressive. In 2020, 2021, I could not trade enough. I looked down at my fingers one time during the mania and I was like, I don't have enough fingers to do all the trades that I want to do. And I was like cracking up. I would like wake up at two, three in the morning. I watched Tim Gratani's DVD trading tickers and he has so much patience and I had nightmares and I, I was like stuck in this position and I was like, it was like a short selling nightmare. And I was trying to have patience. I was trying to be like Tim Gratani. I don't even short sell anymore. My life has gotten much less stressful since that change. But I woke up at two in the morning and like, I was conflicted because Tim Gratani says, have patience, but I was getting squeezed. And I was like, ah, and I woke up in a cold sweat and I was like, oh, oh I don't short sell anymore. Thank God. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was just a nightmare. It was a bad dream. You just got to, you got to take the volatility. You got to adapt. If you want to trade small, if you want to donate, do it. You know, if you want to trade big and you, you want to be aggressive, I don't think that this is the right time. I see from like your Instagram stories and stuff like that. You hang out with like a lot of traders, like a lot of guys. And, um, you know, when you're hanging out with people, like there's like conversations and stuff like that. And would you say that like the strategy conversation changes mostly over the years? Or would you say that it stays the same, you know, like OTC breakouts or like, you know, shorting gappers or whatever? Do you think like the strategy has changed a little bit over the years from like when Tim Bertani started or it's just kind of been the same stuff? Yeah, so it was interesting. I mean, part of the reason why I got into teaching was like, I've been, I've lived a great life thanks to these patterns, but I'm also cursed. Like I, I can't, I'm, I'm addicted. I'm like this alcoholic bartender serving people drinks and I'm like one for you, one for me. Um, and I'm like, if I teach this stuff, maybe I can collapse the patterns if enough people do it. And then I'll be free and I'll make a lot of money from teaching. I have made a lot of money from teaching, but I haven't collapsed the patterns. Now there's more short sellers than ever. And the good news is the short sellers are the new promoters. And so I'm so grateful. Like my whole Twitter feed is like every day thanking short sellers. Like, thank you for being such fucking like psychos and shorting these low flow plays and helping spike them up with far more volume than the promoters ever did. Like, you know, Jordan Belfort can keep highlighting videos with Leo pretending that he's Leonardo DiCaprio when he's not and he still owes his victims $100 million. But the promoters are gone and short sellers are spiking stocks bigger. So I'm like, short sellers, send me your addresses. I want to send you edible arrangements. I want to keep you healthy. I know you have health <laughs> problems. Let me give you some fruit. Let me give you some vitamins. Maybe give them some vitamin water so that they keep shorting. And I like to mess with them too. Like if you look at my Twitter feed, like short sellers, don't just have health problems. They have very thin skin. So like when I'm like, look at these little toxic lepers in their fucking discord rooms and like they're you know, <laughs> only showing their wins. They don't like showing their losses or their locate fees. And I'm like, you little fucking, you know, despicable toxic leper short sellers. Thank you for spiking, you know, I lag in HKD. Why the fuck would you ever short? I lag you dumb motherfuckers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how important would you say is risk management in your strategy, Tim? Because shorts are, you have the ability to lose infinite amounts of money, but there's also times, like you said, where if you're long biased, these stocks don't bounce either. So what is your risk management strategy? This is the crazy thing. So short sellers aren't wrong in their fundamental analysis. Like these are crap companies. They do go down. Like short sellers win the majority of the time. But you have those black swans that pop up and it could be any single one of them. Risk management, like sometimes they're just skipping on air. They get halted, the volatility halts, the brokers have issues. I think that it's very, very dangerous to be a newbie short seller. I mean, even like literally like Jack Kellogg, Tim Lento, like Kai Williams, they lost six, seven figures on HKD. Like even the best short sellers that I know are losing big sometimes. Again, you win more than you lose, but newbies, just don't have the experience or the know-how. This is why if you are gonna short, I encourage you to trade extra small. Risk management is position sizing. You can't put like a little stop loss, like newbies are like, I'll just put a stop loss and that way if I go, if it goes against me, I lose 5%, ha ha ha. And you know, and you're like, you dumb fucking newbie, like you, that the stop loss doesn't mean that you can get out right away. Same thing on the long side, you know, the market makers see this hard stops and the market makers love taking it out below key round numbers. Um, and so newbies think that they're protected, but they're just not. So it's really dangerous to trade with size 
And then again, I know that many short sellers don't start with size. It's just like, oh, just a little trade. It's up so much. I can make a little. And then you, it's a very slippery slope because you keep adding. You're like, I got to average up. I got to average up. Um, and it's, it's can you overcome that crazy squeeze? Because sometimes the squeezes happen for several days, like Tupperware, um, you know, like junk stocks like yellow, um, even if they go bankrupt like a few days later. Um, but the overall trend is down. So if you do have the patience, then, you know, you can hold for a while and, and still make money. So there's money to be made short selling. It's just risky. Yeah, I think it's very key that you said position size management because a lot of people don't talk about that. They just talk about the max loss, which is you need to have that. But if you're oversized in this stock, number one, the liquidity could be fighting against you and you are your own worst enemy because your losses get exponentially larger. So I've personally found myself that the smaller I size, the more money I actually make because I'm less emotional and I'm able to be more patient on the stock. So I think that's very important. I think people like even long should trade smaller. It's it's crazy how much you can do when it's not like money gets in your head when you're trading big and you know the pressure's on and it changes your whole perspective. You don't think about size or patience or, or anything. It's very, very dangerous, um, you know, with too much size for newbies and for veterans too. Hi, we've got a baby here too. It's not my baby, but it's a baby. Oh, I was like, there's some news coming out to the social medias. Nope, nope, nope. Not my baby. Not my baby. I'm just a babysitter sometimes. So you mentioned the, the stop loss situation, and I was trying to find it on the chart. I'm too stupid to remember, but I do remember the stupid mistake. So James and I were on the phone on RKDA. You mentioned that, you know, just because you put a stop loss in doesn't mean that you're going to get out. I'm somebody that actually experienced that exact situation. And on RKDA... Thank you for your sacrifice. I appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I always thank short sellers. I say we appreciate your sacrifice for the greater good, for the greater spikes. You're sacrificing yeah. your money. You're sacrificing your sanity. You're sacrificing your health. Ask not what the short seller can do for you, but what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it gaps up and then it sells off in the morning. And I'm like, I'm so fucking right. I'm so fucking right. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it just limits up and gaps out of nowhere. And that that uh, most most brokers route their stops through ARCA. And the thing that they don't tell people is, especially on these small caps, if it limits up higher than 50 cents and it just skips bids and asks completely, then ARCA won't execute you. Because there's bands of where they allow slippage. And when it gets over that, they won't just execute you at any price. And so I had 3,000 shares roughly. I got 300 off in the limit up. And I, had a, I was like, market stop out of this bitch. Nope, that didn't help at all. And then all of a sudden, I'm stuck. And then James is like, oh, yeah, I already got out. I was like, you fucking dick. <laughs> you fucking dick. Yeah, and so I'm stuck. We and appreciate all of a sudden your it opens. sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> you know? there's, there's, there's so many brave short sellers out there for who we owe so much a debt of gratitude. You know, this is like it's I can make a lot of analogies, but you understand what I'm saying. Like it's these squeezes are amazing. Like promoters, OTCs are, are pretty dead right now. I think a lot of promoters are, are waiting to see how like the Atlas trading trial plays out because a lot of OTC promoters and like shady promoters do what like Atlas trading did. So they're like very worried. So you just don't see that many pumps. You pull up HCNWF. Do you guys remember this one a few months ago? This was like the last great pump that I remember. HTNWF? HCN. HCN. Charlie, Nancy. Hypercharge. Yeah, Look at that pump. That was a beautiful pump, but that was not short sellers. That was like just a, a hard copy like promotion. I, I was literally, I was flying to Dubai with, with Jack Kellogg and we were watching this and it was like crazy. I was in at 60 cents. I was like, let me play it safe. I'm out at 63 cents. I was like, we're flying to Dubai. I don't know if we're gonna land, you know, in time. He held it overnight from like 60 to like 87, I think. But still, I, you know, neither of us expected to go to four bucks. That was a, a great pump, but this is a very common thing that promoters used to do and we just you know i say rest in peace i think a lot of promoters maybe they're in rehab um you know maybe they're they're in jail maybe they've sold their email lists maybe they've burned their email lists. i don't know but we just haven't seen that many promos 
Fortunately, short sellers have come in with much more volume in the stock spike so much more beautifully. Pull up VFS. That was a beautiful short squeeze. I thank all the short sellers listening for their sacrifice for VFS. Whoa. Wow. Oh, yeah. Woo. And then even VFS WW at WW, the warrants kept going. Like, this is how crazy it was, although it finally cracked. Pull up like a VFS WW. Oh, VFF. To, oh, the war. Not Weight Sorry. Watchers. Not Weight Watchers. But Weight Watchers, <laughs> I, I think. Like, but it's man. like, this, these are, this is what's spiking. So I, I just try to focus on whatever's spiking. I'm, I'm grateful for all the volatility. I'm grateful for the plays, whether it's a short squeeze, whether it's a promo. But this is what I'm looking for. And I think more people should focus on these kinds of inefficiencies where the stocks don't deserve to be up that much, but for whatever reason they are. And that creates more predictable patterns than trying to guess like the value if you try to guess the value of a company, I think that you know you just have so low odds, especially if you have a small account, it's gonna to be tough to try to grow your account. I like these inefficiently priced plays. Yep. Something that you mentioned, Tim, is the Atlas trading guys. And I know that you have it out for the promoters. So what do you think about that whole situation with Atlas and uh, just your thoughts on that? I never have it out for anybody. I just, people just have thin skin. Like I always, I have a whole video like thanking the Atlas trading for all their pumps. Like, you know, it was great to buy the pumps. Like even, what was it? Uh, FaZe Clan, F-A-Z-E. I was so grateful to those guys. Like there were so many of them and they would always, they would always like mention the ticker in their little, what, what's, the, what's the software they use? Not Discord rooms, Twitch. They have Twitch rooms and like, I can almost guarantee that they were like texting each other being like, I'll mention the ticker at 11 a.m. I'll mention it at 11, 10 a.m. I'll mention it at 11, 20 a.m. And they spiked the stock so beautifully. Now it's like useless, but like FaZe Clan, Atlas Trading, any of these groups that create these inefficiently priced stocks, like I like it. And I always said, you know, to the Atlas Trading, like that, that one guy with the crazy Greek in the last name, he took it personally and he was like, he made a video and he's like, fuck Tim Sykes. I think he like, then, you know, I'm in his like last video before he got busted. Um, I, I don't That's want promoters to end. Like <laughs> I was, I, I'm grateful for the promoters. Like I, if they have a Coke problem, I'll give them, I'll help them with rehab. <laughs> Whatever, whatever it takes. I don't want to be like, what was that movie with Denzel Washington where he had a Coke problem and they didn't want to send him to rehab. So they, they specifically like the lawyer got him like extra Coke. I don't want to do that. I want rehab. I want the promoters to live a long life with many You just want them to live as long as possible to keep pumping as long as possible. To create as many plays for us. I appreciate their sacrifice. They sacrifice their souls. They're going to spend eternal damnation with their souls. And they're doing this to create great pumps for us to trade. Thank you. Thank you. Short sellers. Like if you did, if you did like a, a heart, like examination on short sellers, there could probably be a study that like heart, you know, like, the, like, I don't know, health shorting health wise, like probably you have like health you, risks you of short selling. You cut your, your lifespan in half by short selling. Like it's, I appreciate the sacrifice. I want to live a long time. So I'm not into that, but I appreciate people who, you know, are like, you know what? I hate this company. I have a toxic mindset. I'm a, a, a you know, negative leper. And I love being in discord chat rooms and having like fake screen names and fake Twitter accounts. <laughs> I appreciate them so much. We need more of them. That I've never really heard the answer to, but I've always like kind of wondered in the back of my mind is like, how do you feel that some of your students are like teaching now, you know, like you're, you've had like successful students and now they're kind of like teaching some of them have their own discord rooms and stuff like that. Um, I've always wondered like, how do you kind of feel about that? Well, especially the short bias ones. Yeah. Especially the short bias ones. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I, I appreciate everyone's sacrifice um I, I think it's very dangerous i think it's very dangerous uh to short sell as a newbie but you know someone has to get squeezed to create these great spikes that i love trading so i don't choose who does it um you know and i think that we do need more teachers i appreciate that my students are, are still fully transparent like even alex props to you you know for, for talking about that big loss that you had like we need more transparent traders. So whatever your strategy is, understand, I make a lot of jokes, like, don't take things so personally. This goes for everybody out there. Um, but at the same time, like, 
I'm just looking for opportunities, whether it's a short squeeze, whether it's a promo. Um, I'm always looking for some kind of catalyst. Um, I love breaking news plays. You know, it, when there's no breaking news, when there's no short squeezes, when there's no pumps, I mean, I don't, there's not much for me to trade. I'm not trying to invest in the long run. So the more Discord rooms, the more people um, that, that short sell, um, I encourage like a lot of like newbie short sellers to try to teach other short sellers and teach them the wrong rules to create even more short squeezes. Like I want as many untrained short sellers as possible um, just for more squeezes. I don't, I don't take things personally. Like it's, it's, it's all about just more opportunity because when you have more opportunity, not even just for, for earning, like I sold HCN WF way too early, but it was a good lesson. And I think that a lot of people long and short, traders will benefit by just seeing so many of these. Like, I, I hate it when someone says like, I've never seen a play like this before. That means that you either A, you're not studying like all these crazy supernovas or you haven't studied the past. I think a lot of people would do better by studying the past. I say I'm basically a glorified history teacher. I've got 9,000 video lessons, 2,000 webinars. People don't wanna watch these old ones. Like Tim Grittani gave 70 webinars to my challenge students, but he hasn't really been trading that much. Full-time family, man, God bless. But those webinars are gold because the patterns repeat. I can't say like past performance is not indicative of future returns, but it usually is. Absolutely. Tim, this is something I always like to ask people who teach, but as an educator, do you feel pressure like trying to perform for your students or like always like be your best? You know, because it's tough because you have a lot of people with you. And I've always wondered that. Um, I mean, I know like I, I do live trading webinars. I do live trading events. I definitely feel pressure to trade live because it's like, oh, I'm going to see, you know, Tim Sykes trade live. And then I see no good trades. And it's like, how was your trading event with Tim Sykes? Oh, there was no live trading. Like that, that sucks. Um, you know, when I remember I was during one live trading event, I was trading HPCO and I should never have even been in it, but I felt the pressure to trade and I lost like six grand live. And I was like, well, now you know what it looks like to be like a fucking schmuck, like creating a stock I should never be in. <laughs> um, and that was, that was dumb. And, and I still remember it. This was over a year ago. So I, I remember the dumb mistakes and I did a video lesson and I, I, you know, should never have been in it. Pull up HPCO. I don't even know what it's done since. This was when it was like getting squeezed. Um, and I bought like the last, the last part right before. Yeah. That yeah. was 2023. Was that it? No, last go go back to 2022. Maybe it was that big spike back, back there. I think that probably. Yeah, this big volume day. I don't right know. Here, it was one of those, but I shouldn't have been in it. And you definitely feel the pressure. Um, so now for me, I'm trying to teach like you know patience. You don't need to be in a trade all the time. Um, for me, I love like traveling because I actually trade better while traveling. Some people are like, "What am I paying you to be on vacation?" And I'm like, "No, you're paying me for an education." And I don't need to teach. I, I love teaching, but I actually trade better. I trade better while I'm traveling because I'm not forcing trades. Like if I'm, you know, I live in Miami. If I'm in Miami with no jet lag, perfect Wi-Fi, I overtrade. And I'm like, okay, time to make some money. And then I suck. Um, when I'm traveling, I'm doing crazy things. I'm living in that way. I don't want to trade, but I, I say, I, I think of myself as a retired trader. I'll come out of retirement if there's a play that's so good, I would feel guilty missing it. Some people are like, what are you talking about? What kind of mental problems do you have? But like, if you over trade, you should try to focus on the best only. So you don't have to trade every day, uh, especially with like penny stocks. Yeah. I mean, this was, this was when I was trading it. So do you think that, do you think that like the recent attacks, like the FTC has done on, on other places where you know they can't get them for anything related to the sec but they get them for ftc right most of those rooms are long biased right do you feel like things are running not nearly as powerfully or the traps are a little bit different now because you don't really have the strength behind the pump rooms that are on the long side and the morons that are on the short side so you don't have the coupling factor but I mean, there's more moron shorting than ever. And I'm so appreciative of that. Like the short squeezes have created much more volatility, much more upside, um, much more volume than the promoters ever did. And, it, and it's, you know, understandable. So 
again, there's going to be times where like short sellers are going to be right more often. Like if we do crash in September or October, short sellers are going to clean up. Fantastic. If, if we go out, break out to new highs, you know, short sellers will support the medical industry with more checkups, more prescriptions, <laughs> you know, more hernias. I don't know. Um, I mean, there's, there's, I don't know if it's been resolved, but there was an investigation into short sellers and like all these short selling newsletters come out with like these, these short exposés right after each other. I was dip buying APLD a few weeks ago and not one, but two short exposés came out within a half hour of each other, just randomly. Oh, well, we, we discovered the same short thing. Oh, we released it within a half hour. What a coincidence. You were, you were exposing this stock too. Oh no, God, no, we never talked to each other. So, you know, <laughs> that's the same thing with PLTR. Same thing happened with yeah. PLTR. All of a sudden out of nowhere, there's a big short port and we're like, what the fuck? They just had great earnings. Are you shitting me right now? Look, you can count on short sellers. You can count on like, you know, sketchy companies. Like my biggest loss in years was EFTR. I, I stupidly bought the pre-market news. Biotech plays were running. They did a, 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 a I think it was like at 830 in the morning or 8 a.m. Like really positive news release. And then like at 9 a.m. They did a toxic financing. And I was like, Normally I saw toxic financing is like good, good company, like good news in the morning, shady toxic financing in the afternoon or after hours. But this was both pre-market. And I always say expect the worst and you'll never be disappointed. I was not cynical enough. I did not expect that they would have a financing. And you got to think, wait a minute, they just had a, a positive press release like 20 minutes ago. And what, what they, they put out the press release and they're signing like five minutes later, the, the toxic financing at half the price. Like, you, you have to count on the scumbaggery of companies, especially biotech companies. Um, and the good news is it's always going to happen. There's always going to be small companies that are shady. There's always going to be, you know, God bless short sellers. There's always going to be, hopefully, the promoters can make a comeback. Um, but that's that. these are all somewhat predictable. Nothing is 100% of the time. But, like, these are predictable, more than not, uh, patterns that you can trade. Something that's uh, really cool to me, Tim, is that like you're a very successful trader, you're a very successful business owner, entrepreneur, you donate a lot of money to charity. But my question that I love asking people is how do you diversify your income outside of trading? Because I know you donate your trading profits to charity, and I'm sure you have some sort of nest egg to kind of fund your lifestyle. So how do you invest outside of the market to kind of make sure that if you want to never work a day in your life again, you could do that? Is it real estate? Is it I'm, I'm terrible with that. Um, I have nothing. I, I'm all cash. Um, I'm missing out on this, this bull market because I didn't expect it. Um, my teaching business has lost money for two straight years. People are like, oh, you just teach suckers and you profit off it. I'm like, actually, I've lost money because we're investing in new AI tools and, and new programmers and a bunch of stuff. Um, no, I'm, I'm really not a good businessman. Like people think that I am. They're like, oh, Sykes is such a good marketer. I should have a million students if I was a good marketer. Like, you know, I, I've really broken down these patterns and come up with like this now great archive that I think really could change the lives of millions of people. So no, I'm not a good business person. I'm not a good marketer. I suck at it. But cash is better than most people have. Most people just blow it all. So the fact that you have cash sitting is very sick as well. Well, I mean, I've made a lot from trading. I've made a lot from teaching in years past, but, um, you know, it, at the same time, I could do so much better. My accountant yells at me like weekly for donating too much compared to my income. He's like, you know, you're not making any money. Like, why are you donating so much? And I'm like, shut up. Um, it's, it, you, you have to have priorities. I, I, it looks like I spend a lot, but I really don't. Like, I'm, I'm actually pretty frugal. Um, I got rid of all my cars. You know, I, I have a place in Miami, just like for my parents, moved them down from Connecticut. I know you want um, to spend money on food, though, because there was one time that we went out to dinner together in Miami, and you must have ordered three of everything on the menu. <laughs> I mean, food, I think, is a great value play. If you want to say, like, what should you invest in? I think good, great food, like, you can have a world-class dinner and not spend more than like a few hundred or, or a few thousand dollars. It's very tough to get a world-class experience of anything for just a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. If you want like the best of something in an industry, you're gonna have to fork over much more. So I think food is a value play and I also love it. And I also love, you know, like not even just eating, but I love eating with friends and like showing people like new cultures, new cuisines. Like I gave Jack Kellogg, like we were in 
Utah, I, you know, not even like world-class restaurant. I just gave him pad thai for the first time. You know, he, you have to understand Jack Kellogg has been so obsessed with like trading and, and learning. He hasn't gotten out much. Now he's finally getting out a little more. And I'm like giving him pad thai. And he's like, I don't know about this. I was like, trust me, you're going to like it. And then he loved it because pad thai is delicious. And then a few weeks later, we went to Dubai, which is a whole nother level for food. And he loved that. Then we're eating at like the, the top restaurants of this food tour in the UK and Sweden and Norway. He's eating at Geranium, the number one restaurant in the world. Like he's, his education with food like just went up like parallel, like with his, his account, you know, a few thousand dollars to 12 plus million from Pad Thai to Geranium in like a few months. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah. My next question was actually about food, and then Alex said brought the food up. Um, but I'm wondering if you could give one really good restaurant experience and then one really bad one. Because I'm sure you have a bad one in your mind where you're like, fuck, you you don't have to say the name so no one gets sued. I'm just wondering. <laughs> I'll tell you, there's a curse of the world's number one restaurants. Uh, Noma, I went to also the number one, uh, what was his name, in, in Italy, and Geranium. Like, all of them have been rather disappointing. When you get to number one, I haven't been to Central in Peru. We were supposed to go to Peru. We have two new computer labs there, but they had political instability, so I had to cancel my trip. The president got arrested, like, literally the week that I was going to go, which sucked. Um, but, like, all the number ones have been rather disappointing um to me and and it's crazy because they're like world's number one like whenever i post noma everyone's like oh do you got in like this is amazing and i'm like yeah i've been to noma four times i've been very spoiled geranium was good but i i wouldn't put it like number one like here's a here's a little tmi tip jack kellogg puked everywhere after geranium he couldn't handle it he, he missed the next night we went to alchemist which i think is far better um, and he missed Alchemist, which is a 50 course, six hour menu. He didn't even make Holy it. Shit. Lucas and I ate it. Lucas is a good eater. Short bear. Have you had him on yet? You should. No, we're going to get him on soon. I actually went out to dinner with Lucas. It's probably one of the most expensive meals I had. I think it was like 1500 a person. <laughs> I mean, he can, he can eat a lot, but he's like seven foot three, you know? So it, it's like, a, it's like a small meal for him, but you know, he's a, he's a great guy, great trader. I'm going to see him in a few weeks in Japan. We've got a, a crazy food tour all over the best restaurants in Japan in like what, three weeks. So I'm excited for that. You know, be very careful with a lot of these rankings. Like I, for me, when I'm, when I'm looking at food, I don't just look at like Michelin. I'm cross-referencing Michelin, TripAdvisor, Yelp, Guyot. I'm looking at everything. Like I, I want to see it. I want to see it all. And, and, you know, Michelin, even the world's top 50 is, is very, you know, biased. It's, it's, you know, you can look at any industry and, and pretty much find corruption. Man. Sorry to be negative. Those are short sellers. You love that. I got one more. I got one more question for you, Tim, and then we'll wrap it up. Is if you were to go back and change anything, would you change anything in your career, whether it be starting or anything like that? Any regrets in your trading career, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't like again. I have like this crazy sense of humor. I wouldn't necessarily. I would be more careful with my words. I I say a lot of stuff like to make people laugh, but like again, people take it personally. And I'm like, I was just kidding. Like, stop having such thin skin, you fucking toxic leper short seller. You know, like, so I, I <laughs> wish that I wish that short sellers had thicker skin. <laughs> no, but it's, I, you know, it's I, I say dumb stuff sometimes and I wish I could like keep it in. But, like, you know, it's literally verbal diarrhea. Like, you know, if you actually go to India and have like real diarrhea, you can't keep it in. Like, it's you don't have a choice. <laughs> and this is. The same kind of thing with this mouth. Like I, I say these things, I'm talking to short sellers. I'm like, you know, preparation for this interview. Don't make short selling jokes. Don't make short selling jokes. I can't, I can't help it. So it's. Yeah, we don't take it personally, bro. It's we, Dude, we're none of us take any of this personally at all. No, I know. But some, some toxic leper short sellers who live in their parents' basements <laughs> and they have five fake usernames in five different chat rooms watching this will take it too personally because it hits too close to home. And they're like, Sim Sykes is talking about me. And, you know. <laughs> I feel bad. We'll know, we'll know them in the comments. They'll come out. We'll see them. We'll see them in the comments. I, I joke around. I kid. I kid. I joke with you. Come on. Like, 
Um, what is that? Triumph the little dog. Like that's what it is. It's it's my my joking that get in my big mouth that gets me in trouble sometimes. If I could just shut the fuck up and like just focus on teaching and trading. But that's, that's what makes you that's what makes you so unique, you know? That impression of Adam Sandler was really good. I mean, we're Jewish. It's it's in my genes. It's in my genes. When I'm thin, I can be Adam Sandler like, you know, someone someone actually stopped me the other day like this wasn't recent cuz now I'm like thinnish, but like when I was fat, someone stopped me and they're like, "You know, you know which actor you look like?" And like when I was younger, I looked like Ben Affleck. So I was like, "Yeah, I look like Ben Affleck. Thank you." And they're like, "No, you look like Seth Rogen." And I was like, "Fuck you. You're wrong." You know? I'm like when I'm fat and I'm Jewish, I do look like Seth Rogen. But now Seth Rogen's thin and he's all like, you know, stylish now, so that doesn't even apply. I got I got one more thing that just came into my head because I remember back in the day, Tim, that you had the nice watches, the cars, this, that. Is there any of those big purchases that you regretted immediately after you purchased it? Um, what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, um, no, it's it wasn't immediate. So I'll I'll tell you one story that really changed my life. Going to the village in Bali really helped. Getting my second Lamborghini was a game changer because first Lamborghini, childhood dream, accomplished. I had used to have posters up on the walls. I never even dreamt as a kid of like owning nice cars. I was like, I just want to drive them. I wanted to drive like a Ferrari Testarossa. Then I owned the Ferrari and the Lambo and the Rolls Royce and the McLaren. And they were fun. They're all fun. But when the second Lamborghini came, I felt nothing. And I was so freaked out. And I had like a whole, you know, short selling esque type like health crisis where, you know, I just, I was worried. Like, I was like, why do I feel nothing? Like, this is my childhood dream. But frankly, ever since that moment, like it was, you know, once you're over it, you're over it. And I still like nice cars, but I have no desire to own them anymore. Like if I drive them, I drive them. That's cool. But like, it really changed my priorities. And, And I really think that a lot of people should always question their priorities, get very introspective, what motivates you, what moves you, and, and don't be afraid of changing, um, you know, mid, mid uh, journey or, or mid career. Like maybe you don't like your career and, and you should change it. Like, or maybe you don't like your strategy. Maybe, you know, if you're a short seller and I don't want this, I want more short sellers, but if you are a short seller, tired of waking up early, trying to get locates, getting squeezed, having health scares, having, you know, the ERs like come to you and like, you know, the ambulance is, cost a lot of money and i don't know if the short selling brokers have insurance i don't know how that works but um (laughs) you just have to you have to really judge everything like you know trading is all about adapting um your goal should also be about adapting so once i started donating more really made me happier inside um i know it sounds corny but it's true and now trading small really helps because like trading big like trading big lost the adrenaline long or short i don't have the adrenaline rush anymore trading big like i used to when i made my first hundred thousand dollars freshman year over the weekend isco bought it in the 17 sold it in the 29s over the weekend gap up um you know amazing ne- sold it too soon the next day it was at 40 i didn't care i made over 100 grand took my whole freshman dorm out to dinner one of the best days of my life opened my mind up to how much you can make and i didn't even time it perfectly then I had a few other 50, $100,000 wins. Every single one of them, less adrenaline rush. I was like, yeah, I still got it. Cool. You know, especially short selling. The big thing for me as a teacher, even if I banked on a short, a lot of my students couldn't get the execution. They couldn't get the borrow. I have a whole music video called No Borrow, No Cry. Um, and, and so I... I I've I seen grad- that. It's pretty fucking I, funny. Like <laughs> I gradually rotated into going long and, and it's... For me now, the the adrenaline rush is when a student makes a thousand or ten thousand a day for the first time, or not even money, but just does a well executed trade. That gives me immense pride. And now I donate all my trading profits to charity. That makes it more meaningful for me because normally, if you make a thousand bucks, it's not going to really influence my life. But a thousand dollars, I know how far that can go in Bali or Philippines or in the thirty countries that we have charity projects. Like forty five dollars can feed a family of five for a month in Bali. You can build a house for $2,500. So now I'm thinking in terms of where can this money go? That makes it more meaningful for me. So always look for meaning in your your life and in your career. Um, and, and don't be afraid to change. 
As, I mean, if you had asked me in the beginning, like you would, you would get, you would have all these cars, you would get sick of them, you would donate all your money to charity, you would donate too much compared to your income, and I'd be like, shut the fuck up, what are you talking about? Like, goes against everything this teenager used to want, but now I'm much happier than ever. So, you just what gotta shifted? Adapt. What shifted for you? What shifted from your life? You obviously, it shows that you have a love for trading. It shows that you have a love for teaching, but everything that you post now is all charity and not in a bad way, but what shifted for you? Just, you know, it opened my mind when you travel more, I, I can't encourage all of you to travel, especially to third world countries. It gives you perspective. And, you know, part of the reason why we're doing, doing this documentary um, for, for Bali, like I, I sell finance. This is our third documentary. I sell finance, all of that. No donations go to any of that. It, all the donations go specifically to the, the projects that we do, but I self fund this because I want people to see it. And, you know, not just, okay, charity is good, helping people in third world countries, that's good. But like seeing how they live, seeing how little they have, but like, especially people in Bali, like they're so positive, they're so just grateful to be alive and to have their family, you know, in the Philippines and Laos and Nepal and South Africa, I was just in Tanzania. All these people have such immense positivity. And then you look at America, the richest, most successful country in the world. We have an opioid crisis, people are so, sad about traffic and the political divide. And it's like, do you know how fortunate you are? No, you don't because you don't have perspective. So I really want to show the third world kind of perspective to the first world. I think it can really help just have, have people really be much happier with what they do have. And especially take advantage of the opportunity. Like literally I was in Tanzania with my laptop and like the whole staff came over. They had never seen a laptop before. We went to this one place. I encourage everyone to go to Pemba Island in Tanzania. It's off the grid. The whole island basically is two, two hotels, really nice hotels, but the rest of the island, they only got electricity last month. And we're driving by these little communities and they're literally, there's like, I saw this one house, they had a light bulb and they were all just dancing around the light bulb because they had never been able to see at night. Like it's, it's crazy to me in this day and age and they just got electricity and they were, they didn't know like we were driving by, they didn't care, they were just happy. And it was like, can you imagine being that happy if you saw a light bulb? How many, what percent of Americans, if you just had a black house, like a blackout or the power went out and you have a light bulb, how many Americans, what percent would be so happy and you're dancing around the light bulb like, yeah, 99% of Americans, if you had no power and the light bulb comes back on, they, would, they wouldn't be grateful. They'd be angry. They'd be like, screw this town. What's wrong with the government? <laughs> like, it's just perspective. So I, I think that you need to live more, you need to travel more, you need to experience more, and you need to be open-minded. And, and you'll be shocked at what really moves you and what you can learn from your experiences. And understand, most people don't have the luxury of being able to like, oh, I would love to go to a third world country, I would love to go anywhere. Most Americans don't even have savings of a few thousand dollars. They work at a job that they hate. 75% of Americans under the age of 30 hate their jobs. So it's like, it's a luxury to be able to travel. That's part of the reason why, you know, one of, the, one of you guys asked, do you ever get tired of creating content? It's a luxury for me to travel and it's a luxury for me to share it because I want more people to see this stuff. So is there a Tim Sykes charitable jet line coming soon to an airport near you? No, I don't even do jets anymore. I mean, that was during the pandemic. Um, one one crazy time, I was on this this program called Jet Suite. I don't know if you remember Jet Suite or Jet Smarter. Um, Jet Smarter. Jet Suite still goes to Vegas. Jet Smarter. It was like Uber for jets, and I think I paid like five grand or seven grand for the year, and you could just take jets like anywhere. And it was crazy. Like there was like random people on the jet, and I was like, oh, what are you guys doing going there? And they're like, wow, we got nothing else to do, and it's like free unlimited jet thing. But during this was like my last jet ride and we lost, uh, what was it? What, what's steering on a jet called? There's a word for it. Why do I always forget this? Do you guys know? No. A turbine? I got no clue. No. I should know this. Anyways, there was a loud crash and I, I heard a crash and we couldn't land at the airport that we needed to. And like my parents were coming to pick me up. Like it was, it was scary. There was nothing I could do. Loud crash. Like people are crying. And it was, it was during like the, the Bitcoin spike and everyone was like a crypto holder on the plane. And I was just picturing like 
the headlines that you have like seven crypto traders and one penny stock trader dead. Like this is the top. And I was just like, I'm going to fucking go down in a jet with these crypto fucks. Yeah. And I was so pissed. That's the worst way. That's the worst way to go with all the crypto guys in the plane with you. <laughs> it was there was an emergency landing. Like it was a rough landing. Um, we're all okay. And you're going down like, with crypto hodlers. <laughs> and it was it was right when like Bitcoin was at like you know fifty five thousand. It had already crested a little bit. And it was like after Sailor was like, put your whole house, mortgage your house, mortgage your business, put into Bitcoin. Shut the fuck up, Sailor. You grow. You you throw. Fantastic parties, you out of touch billionaire. People shouldn't mortgage their home and their business to go into crypto. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and this was this was my my last jet ride. I haven't gone on a jet ride since. Um, they they usually don't even have good Wi-Fi. Like I I need good Wi-Fi. Like you know. So no 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 jet line. And also again, like the the charity is completely separate. We donate 100 percent to all the projects. We're a 501c3. People think that like oh you have a a charity. No, I'm transparent with my trades. I'm tra transparent with my donations. So I want to be clear about that. I'm a, and where can people donate, Tim, if they want to donate to uh, support? So if you go to karmagawa.org, um, it was the Tim Sykes Foundation, but I don't need anything in my name. I'm not looking for like another rich white guy looking for attention. Like we don't need that. So um, karmagawa, uh, K-A-R-M-A-G-A-W-A dot uh, org. And so I have a partner. His name is Matt Abad. He's a great photographer, Gawa in the Filipino Tagalog language means to do or to make. So we partnered and we're like, you know, he takes photos and videos that are really emotional. We donate money, we have charity merch, um, and it all goes to helping these these different causes and communities. And it's it's given me so much motivation. And I, I just hope that, you know, the short sellers out there continue to short, to, to squeeze people. And no, I'm sorry, I'm done with the short squeeze joke. <laughs>